The new 15-inch MacBook Pro is slower. They took away the ports. The touch bar is useless. In classic Apple fashion, it wouldn't be a release of theirs without a little bit of drama. Yo guys, Jonathan here, finally got my hands on the 2016 15-inch MacBook Pro with Touch Bar, and before we get into the good, the bad, and potentially ugly, let's enjoy the unboxing. So taking a look at the box on the outside, we get a little sneak peek of that Touch Bar action. Next, I'm gonna crack it open so we can get a taste of that super satisfying plastic. And once we're inside, we get the MacBook Pro itself in the super attractive space gray finish, a USB-C cable, and USB-C power brick, and finally, you got the literature and Apple stickers. Now, this MacBook Pro is the mid-tier model, which rocks a 2.7 gigahertz i7 CPU, 16 gigs of RAM, a 512 gigabyte SSD, AMD Radeon Pro 455 graphics. And with this MacBook Pro, there's a total of four Thunderbolt 3 ports, two on one side and two on the other with a headphone jack. So one of the things I was most curious about with this machine was the SSD. The 13-inch MacBook Pro was incredibly fast, and that left me wanting to know exactly how much faster this was. For starters, in Blackmagic Disk Speed Test, just like the 13-inch MacBook Pro, this tapped out at 2,000 megabytes per second on the read side of things. But diving a little deeper and using the AJA system test, I actually got speeds over 2,000 megabytes per second on the right side, and over 2,600 megabytes per second on the read side. For contrast, last year's mid-tier 15-inch MacBook Pro, that clocked in around 1,400 megabytes per second on the right side, and just over 1,800 on the read. So yeah, that is a ton of information and numbers being hurled at your face, but what does that actually mean? What I did was duplicate a 43 gigabyte file on both machines, so essentially what we're doing is rewriting that file onto your computer, which really shows off the write speeds. On the 2016 MacBook Pro, that took 46 seconds to complete, whereas last year's MacBook Pro took a minute and 16 seconds. So you're looking around a 30 second difference between the two, which may not seem like that much, but if you multiply that over time or bigger files, it's actually a pretty substantial difference. Now next it's time to get into a little bit of that drama on whether or not this year's MacBook Pro is actually slower than last year's. If you didn't catch it, there was a lot of confusion and weirdness with Geekbench 4 showing this year's MacBook Pro coming up way short against last year's model. There were some out there way in left field that mathematically just didn't make sense, which kind of led me to believe that it was more on the Geekbench side of things where the application really wasn't updated for these new MacBook Pros. For reference, the 2015 MacBook Pro that I used for testing was the same tier. That rocked a 2.5 gigahertz i7 CPU, 16 gigs of RAM, a 512 gigabyte SSD, and AMD R9 M370X graphics. So with Geekbench 4, the 2016 MacBook Pro on the single core side scored 4,275, and as far as multi-core, 13,331. Now as far as the 2015 MacBook Pro on the single core side, we're looking at 4145, and then multi-core, 13,563. Now this is a perfect example of why I'm not a huge fan of synthetic benchmarks, because on paper, if we looked at this, as far as single core scores, the new MacBook Pro is slightly faster, not by much, but on the multi-core side, it is actually slightly slower, which may lead one to believe that you're getting less performance. Without a doubt, you are getting much better graphics performance. In Tomb Raider, I was getting about 10 frames per second more on the new MacBook Pro compared to last year's. But where it got really interesting for me was seeing overall how much faster the new MacBook Pro was compared to last year's. In Handbrake, taking a five minute 4K ProRes file and transcoding that to H.264, the 2016 MacBook Pro took five minutes and 11 seconds, whereas the 2015 MacBook Pro took six minutes and 10 seconds. Definitely faster, not by a huge margin, but where I was really surprised was testing out Adobe Premiere. Taking two minutes of red 5K raw footage and then exporting that into a 4K H.264 file, the 2016 MacBook Pro took nine minutes and three seconds, where the 2015 MacBook Pro took 16 minutes and 57 seconds. So that is a pretty massive difference between the two, almost to the point where I didn't think it was that much faster. I ran the test multiple times, triple checked the sequence, the export settings, made sure both were using OpenCL, and time and time again, the new MacBook Pro was much faster. So next with Final Cut Pro 10, I wanted to test it out where it wasn't necessarily taking advantage of the optimization or the quick sync. So what I did was take a five minute 5K red raw file, turned off background rendering, and then exported it or essentially transcoded it out to ProRes. The 2016 MacBook Pro did the job in 19 minutes and two seconds, whereas the 2015 MacBook Pro did that in 25 minutes and 51 seconds. So between this and especially Adobe Premiere, you are getting some pretty serious performance gains. So now with performance out of the way, it is now time to address the big fat elephant in the room, the touch bar. Is it a gimmick? Is it useful? I will lead with saying that it is useful, it's not a gimmick, but it's not a reason to go out and sell your old MacBook Pro to immediately buy this. 
What it is is an OLED strip that takes place of the traditional physical function keys. So you can see if you expand it, you are getting all the buttons that were previously there. Now the most important thing to consider with the touch bar is to remember that it is really early in the game. There are very few apps that really take advantage of this right now, but as time goes on, it will expand. Being able to slide the brightness up or down is kind of cool and same thing applies to the volume. Having a dedicated Siri button is also nice. So here I am looking for youtube.com slash TLD and it works instantly. But what I found really cool with the touch bar was when I got into Safari. So if we go into YouTube, the game changer for me was scrubbing through YouTube videos with a touch bar. And I know there's probably a ton of you out there who are gonna hate on that saying, what's the big deal? But really, it's just one of those things that is kind of cool and fun to use. Jumping into a mini rant, I kind of feel like we're at this point in technology where everyone is jaded and doesn't really appreciate things anymore. Earlier today, MKBHD put out this tweet. Phone reviews in 2040. Bezelus AK OLED, 25,000 milliamp hour battery, literally an i7 Xeon processor, full frame F1.2 camera, not water resistant, three out of 10. And honestly, that doesn't sound far off. Instead of looking at things for what they are, you are not worse off with a touch bar than you were with the old function keys, you are getting more. So why not roll with the change instead of fighting everything that comes out? Now I guarantee there's gonna be the same reaction with emojis on the touch bar. Someone out there is gonna be like, lame, only losers use emojis. But the thing is, I use them, most of you out there use them. I'm not gonna lie and be fake and act like I don't because I do. Jumping back on topic where I also found the touch bar to be useful was using tabs in Safari so you can easily pop up a new tab. And what I really liked is visually being able to see all your tabs laid out and hopping back and forth between either of the options. Now beyond that, Final Cut Pro 10 is a program that I use constantly. It's what I'm using to edit this video right now. And honestly, going into this, I was a little bit apprehensive and skeptical on whether or not this would actually be useful for video editing. Just like I feel with the touch bar overall, with Final Cut 10, not everything makes sense to use over a keyboard shortcut. So here, instead of blading or cutting and then deleting, I am taking care of a two move operation in one tap. What I found the absolute most useful with Final Cut Pro 10 and the touch bar was when playing back a project full screen. With the touch bar, you can literally see your entire timeline, which is super useful because you're not just scrubbing between random times. You can see information and cuts and layers, and that is a really cool thing. So yeah, again, the touch bar, it's not revolutionary. It's not gonna change your life. I'm not gonna tell you to go run on eBay and sell your 2015 MacBook Pro, but maybe it's been a couple years. Maybe you're due for an upgrade. Maybe you've never bought a MacBook Pro. It is not gonna make your life any worse and it's actually pretty cool. The same thing applies for Touch ID. It is not a revolutionary feature, but it is really nice being able to log into your Mac with your fingerprint. This will trickle over to purchases and the passwords. And just in case you were wondering, the Touch ID button also double function as the power button just in case you need to physically shut your machine down. Now with that, there is definitely some not so good with these new MacBook Pros, the most obvious being dongle life. Regardless of where the future is going or where things will be in a couple years, right now, you are gonna need some adapters. For me, not having an SD card slot on this MacBook Pro is something that I feel because I use one all the time. So because of that, things can get a little messy and crazy pretty quick, but as time goes on and more and more USB-C devices come out, it will get better, but as of now, it's something that you cannot avoid. Now, battery life for me hasn't been amazing, but on the flip side of that, I've really only done heavy and intensive applications and testing. So look out for an update on how it fares over time in more day-to-day -day situations. Touching back upon some good, the speakers are way better on the 2016 MacBook Pro compared to last year's. Now I totally understand that is really hard to portray through speakers or through headphones, but I assure you the new MacBook Pro speakers are really good. The other huge improvement with this MacBook Pro is the display, which is much brighter and the colors are awesome. 
I've talked about it a million times before, but when I would use a MacBook Pro, the screen would never get bright enough, but with this one, I am super happy. So overall, the new MacBook Pro is thinner, it's lighter, it is faster, it comes in space gray. If you do want one, except that you're losing supports and you're gonna get ready to dongle. The touch bar is useful, but not a game changer. The bigger trackpad is awesome. And the one thing I wanna reiterate and emphasize is that while this is a great machine, it's not something that you need to go out and buy immediately. It's almost like you have to look at this as the version 1.0 of the new MacBook Pros. Early adopters are always gonna run into problems, so if any of these things turn you off, don't buy one. But if you did pick one up, you are definitely gonna enjoy it. Aside from that, thank you guys very much for watching. If you missed it, there's still a 13-inch MacBook Pro giveaway going on. But if you guys think I should give away a 15-inch model, make sure to smash that like button. Probably subscribe so you don't miss that. This is Jonathan, and I will catch you guys later.